Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of Civics Forward. I am delighted to welcome three big thinkers for an important conversation about the business case for civics and democracy. We have a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of time to do it in, so I'm going to jump right into questions. Bill Galston, welcome to the program, and thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So we really appreciate you taking the time. You've recently done some research on the links between democracy and the economy. What you may you make the argument that business or economics and democracy are, are linked. What's the case for that? And what have you found? Let me answer your question in two ways, Mike. Uh, I'm going to start off with a quote from a Harvard Business School professor, Rebecca Henderson, in a recent piece in the Harvard Business Review. And here's what she says. American business needs American democracy. Free markets cannot survive without the support of the kind of capable, accountable government that can set the rules of the game that keep markets genuinely free and fair. And only democracy can ensure that governments are held accountable, that they're viewed as legitimate, and they don't devolve into the kind of crony capitalism that we see emerging in so many parts of the world. That is the heart of the case. In a recent piece for Brookings, my colleague Elaine K. Mark and I drilled down on that case, and we discovered a mountain of evidence developed by economists and political scientists about the strong link between business, free markets, and democracy. That doesn't mean that democracy will always act in ways that businesses appreciate, but it does mean that without democracy, you are subject as a business community to forces that you can't control. Uh, and I'm not sure about many things, but I am sure of that proposition, which is supported both by research and I think by common sense. So you mentioned the, that the link is strong. How strong? Well, just look around. Uh, in, in regimes that are not liberal democracies, that is, where where the influence of the majority is counterbalanced by individual rights, including some market-based rights, uh, businesses are subject to governmental pressures that they're powerless to resist no, no matter how strong they are. Look at what happened in China. Uh, three years ago, Jack Ma was everywhere. Now he's nowhere. What happened? Answer, he fell afoul of the Chinese government. He hasn't yet been thrown into jail like a lot of other Chinese businessmen have, uh, but he's clearly on thin ice. Look at Russia. Uh, or look at what happens in populist majoritarian democracies in Latin America, where everything depends not on what you can do, but on whom you know. Uh, the only sure protection for the abilities of businesses to make decisions for themselves and thrive is an accountable system of liberal democracy with checks and balances, with the rule of law, with independent judiciaries, and all of the other things that go with constitutional democracy as we understand it. So Louise, I'd like to pull you into the conversation. Uh, you know, when people think of iCivics, they think of just the world-class games and learning content that you create. Uh, but you've also been a leader in efforts to create the Educating for America, De American Democracy Roadmap. Uh, that, I think, would probably have given you a very good vantage point on how democracy is in the United States, um, but also how hard it is in a democracy to kind of rebuild some of our fundamental knowledge and skills. Can you tell us where things stand right now with that initiative and also uh, you know, what kind of progress has been made over the last year or year and a half? First of all, thank you so much um, for having us here. Um, so I will uh, add a little bit of context. Uh, as Bill says, uh, the current status may be very polarized in our country, um, but there is a path forward. Uh, we teach at iCivics about half the kids in the country and young people are such a powerful voice of hope 
uh, yet they don't believe in democracy. Uh, about 24% of them think that it's either a bad or a very bad system of government that should frighten everyone. But it also gives us the imperative to invest in them, right? To actually talk to them and convince them. So here we are, polarized country. And what do we need to do in a democracy is to engage with people we disagree with. There is no other path forward than to actually come together. So what we did is to join with 300 other folks to define a roadmap for how to rebuild a productive and renewed democracy to go forward. We didn't develop any kind of national program. We just laid out seven themes and questions that students need to engage with. These are not national standards. These are just things that, that students in our type of constitutional democracy. So we were, uh, we issued the report a couple years ago. Since then, we've done work in about 10 states. Work is ongoing. We're getting new uh, entrants into this project. We've got now policies that have been developed based on the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap. We are pursuing those policies at the state level with our 250 partners, roughly, at civicsnow.org. So this is not the Educating for American Democracy sets out for the roadmap for what we need to do to engage young people in this process, but it is also building a movement which we're very excited about because frankly, we all need to be in this and business has a role in this as well as many of the other players in this ecosystem. So Louise, that's a perfect segue to Janice. You know, you talked about how one of the, one of the things coming out of the roadmap is the questions that children need to engage with. One of the questions that we frequently engage with here at the US Chamber Foundation is, what is the role of business in solving some of these problems or helping communities solve some of these problems? Uh, and one of the most impressive and comprehensive programs out there is the one that Janice has created at Travelers. So Janice Brenner, thanks for joining us. And could you tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing, uh, but perhaps even more importantly, to build on what Bill was saying, why you're doing it? Sure. So, so thanks very much for having me here today with you. Um, I think it's very, it's kind of, at Travelers, it starts with <clears throat> very simply, you know, at Travelers, we've always been a good corporate citizen, but with Citizen Travelers, we are really trying to find new ways to be a corporation of good citizen. And it's really an investment in our employees as well as our communities. Um, and a way for our employees to find purpose and meaningful engagement by being civically involved in their communities. And so we've developed a program um, that really has, you know, a few different features. First of all, it's a, we've kind of created a social network um, and support for people at Travelers who are civically involved. Um, and so we, it's a community of civically involved employees, and we're really celebrating that involvement and also supporting them. Um, and connecting them excuse me, with each other. And then we also um, recognizing the importance of lifelong civic learning. Um, and so providing nonpartisan educational materials that can help our employees be civically involved in their communities. Um, and then really also taking a stand as corporate leaders um, in this space uh, and saying that civic engagement is really a traveler's value. Um, and that it's something that we want to invest in and be a part of. One caveat I'll add, and one thing that's very important about our program and that we set up initially as, as a key pillar of it is that our um, program, which we call Citizen Travelers, is aggressively nonpartisan. So um, a, a key feature of, that, of it is that our employees and our customers are spread throughout the country um, and come from very different perspectives and experiences. And we want everyone at Travelers to feel empowered to be involved civically in their communities in the way they see fit. And so we want Citizen Travelers, we're very careful about making sure that Citizen Travelers is nonpartisan and that we're not telling people kind of how to vote or how to get involved in their communities, but really just telling them to, um, to be involved and that we want to support them in that endeavor. 
I think that's a really important point, especially for the for the business leaders and, and chambers of commerce in the audience. Um, you know, the way that we think of civics, for example, is it's a it's a foundation. It is and, and must remain nonpartisan because it's the foundation that enables partisanship and, and distinctions. Um, but, it, you know, it is a core just core basic knowledge. Uh, I was very disappointed to see a study that came out, I think, last week from from Annenberg that suggests 25 percent of American adults can't name a single branch of the federal government. Um, that's you know, that's not a partisan issue. That's that's a basic fundamental issue of our democracy. Um, but we are polarized. And, you know, Bill, at, at the risk of uh, asking you to repeat an entire lecture that you probably spent months preparing and an hour or more delivering a while back, you, you, you did give a talk uh, entitled America's Polarized Politics. Where does it come from and what can we do about it? Can you give us an abridged version of the answer to those questions? Well, I will try, and then I'm going to segue into a recommendation uh, that involves the business community for addressing it. The short answer to your first question, Mike, is that it's taken us a long time to get into this fix, by my reckoning, about six decades, and there is no silver bullet that's going to get us out of it. Uh, I was in high school in the late 1950s, and I can remember the political scene well. Uh, we sort of agreed on the New Deal. Uh, Eisenhower had seen to that and Keynesian economics just a few years later. Richard Nixon would say we're all Keynesians now. Uh, we agreed on Cold War anti-communism and the entire uh, agenda of social and cultural issues that we now take for granted at the heart of our politics didn't exist as matters of public discussion. And piece by piece over six decades, everything changed. Uh, we lost our consensus on foreign policy, on culture, and on economics, and it became harder and harder for the political parties to come common, find common ground. Uh, the distinctions between the parties and their supporters hardened. Uh, the distance between the two political parties widened, and here we are. Uh, the beginning of the way out, in my judgment, is to resuscitate, not just in word, but in deed, the old operating principle of the honorable compromise. Because compromise, when it's reached, encourages people of goodwill to believe that further compromises in the national interest may be possible. Uh, in just this Congress, we've seen some encouraging uh, signs. There was a bipartisan compromise on infrastructure. There was a bipartisan compromise on guns, gun safety. There was a bipartisan compromise on investment in our manufacturing base, especially uh, semiconductor chips, but uh, other investments as well. And we may now be heading towards a bipartisan compromise on a reform of our basic electoral code, the Electoral Count Act, which governs how presidential elections are resolved. And goodness knows we need some clarity on that before, before 2024. So it is possible. And I would hope that the business community would lend its support to honorable compromise. And I say that uh, because, you know, Rebecca Henderson said that American business needs American democracy, but the reverse is also the case. American democracy needs American business in its collective capacity to speak up uh, for our basic institutions. You are an important part of our civic fiber in this country, and uh, like it or not, you have an essential role to play. And at this point, I don't think silence is an option. I think we would agree with that, Bill. Uh, you know, it's it's been amazing to see the levels of trust that people have in their employers uh, and also the role of businesses in communities across the country at a time when we do have, you know, just 
blinking red indicators of declining trust across many, many of the institutions that I think, to your point, we used to have consensus about. Yeah. Um, Louise, when you were, you know, through your work at iCivics and through your engagement on civics, is there any advice that you have for, for businesses that are watching? Like, what can they actually do? Are there concrete things that they can do if you're a small business or even a, a large business? Yeah, I think, I think there are multiple things that can be done. I think the example of travelers is a really good one uh, for a business engaging directly with its constituency and its stakeholders, with their employees, but also the families of their employees, right? So uh, we really believe that that's very important. There's also specific sets of policies that are, we at iCivics and also EAD work only in bipartisan ways and only with a plurality of points of view. And that process is a hard one, uh, but it does result in very strong policies and supporting those at the state, local, uh, and at the national level is important. So for example, in your local district, if you're a small business, it's important to, in, to ask whether there's an investment in civic education, which can be done in, in as Janice said, an aggressively nonpartisan manner. We've laid out that roadmap. We have engaged directly in the process of ensuring that we contend with a plurality of points of view in that work. It's hard, but it can be done. So those are all the, the kinds of things. Then I would say, obviously, there are programs that are that should be implemented to support civic engagement and civic dispositions within your workforce. So all of those things are really very concrete and very doable. I can't disagree with your description of all of this as hard. I actually didn't have gray hair before I started working yes. at civics and now look at me. Um, <laughs> Janice, you, uh, you have done the hard work and I wonder, are there lessons or is there advice that you would have for other companies that are looking at this and saying, yeah, you know, we, we, we recognize the opportunity to play a really positive role, but where do we start? Sure. So I, what I think that the biggest benefit that I've seen is I've been really inspired by the 30,000 travelers employees and how civically involved people within travelers are. Um, and so I think once we started talking about sort of civic engagement at Travelers, um, I think I would, you know people really responded so positively to it. And I and I and so I think that kind of covers you know when you see your colleagues doing something positive in their communities um, civically or or celebrating civic engagement even through just you know get out the vote effort things of that nature um, it inspires more people to get involved and so I think from that perspective my lesson is I think you might be surprised how much appetite there is for nonpartisan civic engagement within your company and how easy it is to get started and kind of and have it grow. I would say the other thing that, that I think we do really well at Travelers is that, you know, we're 30,000 people spread throughout the country um, and we meet daily um, with people of different identities, experiences and perspectives. And we find ways to connect and work together as a team um, to solve problems and succeed as a business. And I think part of what we want to do as citizen travelers is, is we, we realize we can actually ha harness that spirit of collaboration um, and that um, and 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 suggest and support our employees in taking that same kind of teamwork and innovation and civility really out into their communities in a civic manner and so by supporting them and doing that it's a win-win it's a virtuous cycle because we're telling our employees as a traveler's value to be civically involved in their communities and they're taking all those skills they've learned at Travelers out into their communities to be involved civically. And then in return, you know, they're out in their communities working with people, um, you know, getting to know people in their communities, working through um, issues that are, you know, important in their communities. And so they're learning um, in that regard. They're learning leadership, they're learning teamwork, they're learning to understand, be more empathetic and understanding to different situations. And so they're bringing all those skills, innovating, they're bringing all those skills back to travelers as well. 
And so it's really a, a win-win. That's a really important point because, you know, as we were a few years ago, we put out a, a white paper with Harvard Business Review, the business case for civics. And one of the big takeaways that we had from that project was the clear link between civic skills and especially 21st century job skills, communication, the ability to work as part of a team, the ability to compromise. All of that is just increasingly in a, in a knowledge economy. Uh, so I'm going to shift over now to some of the audience questions. We've gotten quite a few. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Uh, I'll give the first one. I think I know what the answer to this is. Uh, I'll give this to Louise. Louise, how important is it for business to invest in nonprofit organizations that focus on civics? <laughs> As the head of a nonprofit organization. Yeah, right. I think I'd get fired if I said it wasn't. I, so what I think is that the the pool of, of workers that come to business come from young people today, right? So if and we just talked about the fact that these are really the same skills as employable skills. In fact, there's research that shows that if you invest in civic education, you will have more employable uh, workers as a result of it, right? So you're going to have folks who can solve problems that are complex. You have folks who can talk about and debate in civil ways, so on and so forth. So uh, that's why it's important uh, for businesses to invest in, in uh, nonprofit for provisor, but also for the entire ecosystem and movement so that civics becomes a priority for our country. I think we're going to deliver you a better workforce. So I'm going to bring the next question to you, Bill, and, and I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative by changing <laughs> the audience question because I think there's a question that needs to precede it. So the, the audience member asks, how can companies engage young people? Um, but I, I would actually appreciate maybe if you answered, if you explained, are we focusing on the right people if we just limit this to young people? Like you mentioned 60 years of, of democratic decline or deterioration. Is young people the solution or is that just part of the solution? I think the answer to that question is obvious. Uh, in the very long run, it is the solution. But I underscore that very long run is measured in multiple decades. And to be frank, it's not clear to me that American democracy can endure another two or three decades of the level of polarization and conflict that we've seen, uh, which means that it seemed, which means that I think people of all ages, need to be engaged. I'm not going to pull out a program for doing that right now. Uh, but in addition to engaging individuals, uh, I think that the business community as an organized collectivity has to think very hard about the role that it's going to play in the co in coming years. Uh, and if I can be blunt, uh, the American business community is in danger of falling between two stools because there are forces in both political parties that do not wish you well, uh, that regard business as the problem rather than the solution. I emphatically disagree with that, but my voice means nothing without your voices. Uh, and what that means is that I think you have to engage citizens wholesale as well as retail, uh, and you have to throw your weight behind honorable compromise wherever the opportunity presents itself. And you have to tell people what you're doing and why you're doing it. You have to make the case as an organized community that this level of polarization is something we cannot endure indefinitely and we all have the responsibility to do what we can to reduce it uh, before it destroys everything that we've tried to build for hundreds of years in this country. So shifting gears, Janice, um, the, this question from the audience is, what has been your biggest challenge standing up the initiative and how did you overcome it? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> I think it was trying to fit, you know, we have, it kind of goes back to our 
what I said is our mission that we've always been a good corporate citizen and with citizen travelers finding new ways we're finding new ways to be a good corporation of good citizens so I think what's been really interesting about citizen travelers is that um, finding kind of across the enterprise you know how to draw on all the resources that we already have to make citizen travelers a success so I think we've pulled in you know, our community relations, um, which was already very robust. Our, they, that team has been essential to making Citizen Travelers a success, um, as well as, um, you know, trying, you know, figuring out who wanted to be involved from an employee perspective and drawing on those resources and, and pulling in just, um, you know, help throughout the organization. Um, and figuring out kind of rather than I think and that kind of goes back to a previous talk question that we were talking about is like how do you even get started in this and I think my answer is you know what I have been surprised at at Travelers is how much we can draw on the resources we already have to to make citizen travelers a success and so just finding out kind of everything that's going on within the enterprise and how to leverage that to make citizen travelers a success has been has been um, has been fun for me because it's really been, you know, it's been eye-opening as to to how much, you know, how much engagement is already there, and it's just a matter of kind of activating that and making sure everyone's involved and in, and in supporting that. That's a really good reminder that you know, in, in many cases, businesses are not starting from zero. There are things that are being done; they're just not packaged, seen, or approached in a in a wholesale way to you to use Bill's word. Um, so we, we're almost out of time, uh, but the last audience question, and I, I really appreciate this audience member for sending this in. If we could do a lightning round, what, what are you? What would what makes you optimistic about where where we are and where we're heading? Maybe I'll start with uh, Louise. I, when I go into classrooms, young people are full of hope. They're full of civic agencies, and in many cases, sometimes. Uh, that has to be brought out, um, but they, they are what makes me the most optimistic. Uh, I think we just need to build the skills. I think we know how, what to do. I think we know how to do it. And I think if the business community helps us, I think it will be uh, a win-win for everybody. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go with young people. Okay, and Bill, what's your answer to that question? I'm gonna go with the American people as a whole. Uh, there is a vast American middle between the polls uh, that genuinely wants our democracy to work, uh, not simply out of idealism, because a democracy that works is a democracy that works for them. Uh, and I see signs that that vast American middle uh, is becoming conscious of itself uh, and is prepared to reassert itself sooner rather than later in the two-party system, if possible, outside it if necessary. And Janice? I'm going to go with the civically engaged community at Travelers. I mean, they have just wowed me as to how involved people are in their communities in a civic way and how excited people are to get involved. And um, they've inspired me. So I think that businesses should just tap into their employees because they're there. And um, I think excited to be part of you know, a civic community. Well, I would have to say that one of the things that makes me optimistic is knowing that there are people like all of you out there doing this important work in industry, in, in schools, in academia, and in communities. So thank you for the work you're doing. And thank you for, for joining us today for this conversation about, again, what I said, what, what we believe is a really important issue. Uh, and to the audience, thank you again for joining Civics Forward. Uh, it is a production of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and our Civic Trust Initiative. Uh, here at the foundation, we are committed to three, three, three things. Civic literacy, elevating civics as a national priority, and making the business case for civics. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and walk away with some new ideas and some new information about ways that you can become engaged in this initiative. Uh, please, if you'd like to learn more about our work, you can visit uschamberfoundation.org. Also, if you'd like to find out more about the research that Bill mentioned, you can go to brookings.edu, and the name of the report, the most recent report, is 
democracy failing and putting our economic system at risk. It's available on that website. It won't take you long to read it. I highly recommend it. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us.